Welcome to the Sons of Mjolnir podcast. The Sons of... What? This isn't your Sons of Macaroni, yeah! The Sons of Mjol... Mjolnir? This is the Sons of Mjolnir, yeah, yeah, yeah! Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Sons of Mjolnir. As always, I am one of your hosts, Fat Thor. And unfortunately, Cap and Gorgon are not going to be joining me today, but I am joined by a very, very special guest. You may know him as the writer of such titles as The Flash, Green Lantern. If you've seen basically any DC animated movie in the past couple of years, this guy has been behind it. I am joined by the one, the only, Jeremy Adams. Sir, thank you so much for coming and nerd not with me today. It's oh, a real dude, pleasure I'm, to have you. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. Yeah, no, okay. this is great. Yeah, awesome. We, me and Jeremy, we met very briefly at uh, San Diego Comic Con. I was yeah. actually in uh, your Night Terrors panel, and oh, that's, man. that's how you kind of. I mean, I knew it's one of those things. Like I've read your stuff before, but it's like sure. I didn't know like the face to the name. And then right. when I was in the Night Terrors panel, I'm like, oh, I've I've seen his Flash stuff. I was actually working at a comic book shop when your oh. Flash was going, and oh, I cool. remember people like picking it up like it's flying off the shelf that was always like a very hot book of the week when I was working oh, there. man that's so good to hear that was such a I mean that's a funny thing for me um I came at comic books the opposite way that most people come to comic books mm -hmm. like I came from movie and television yeah and I always wanted to be doing comic books I think the first thing I pitched was like 10 over 10 years ago I pitched a Batwing thing to Mike Martz who was running uh the bat he was like the editor-in-chief at the back group at the time mm -hmm. and um, I was working as an assistant at a toy company and I had just done a Green Lantern the animated series which was like my first animated show mm -hmm. and um and and I just kept trying to knock on that door to get into comic books so um you know I'd done some uh, uh future state right before Flash mm -hmm. And the, and the reason we got called in, I, I'm sure you heard the story, but like Dan Didio was going to do this thing called 5G. He really wanted a bunch of new writers. And so he ended up asking a bunch of, like, to get a list of animation writers from Warner Brothers. Mm -hmm. That's where Joseph Campbell and me and Megan Fitzmartin, Tim Sheridan, like we all came from the animation background and we're all sitting in this room and Didio is like outlining his plans for 5G. And I'm like, this is insane, you know? Mm -hmm. But I'm also like, this is awesome <laughs> because yeah. I'm, I'm going to get my shot. Uh -huh. And I really thought I was close. And then he got let go. And, uh, but my name was still on a list. And I don't know, it was, a, it was a while later. And I get a call. It's like, hey, your name's on this list. Would you ever want to do one of these future state? I'm like, oh my gosh, I would love to do anything. <laughs> you know? So, like, oh, yes, please, please. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then I did a backup, the the DC 1 million uh, Black Adam. And then I did a backup for this Black Racer for, uh, uh superman worlds of war and after that so then i get a call and they're like hey uh you have any ideas for the flash i'm like bro i'm a man of a certain age that have loved comic books my entire life uh and i got ideas <laughs> yeah, yeah. and he was like great that's better than what we got you can have it and i was like but the way he said it was like it was like a, a burden you know yeah and i was like okay and <laughs> so i just jumped on it and i think by virtue of warner brothers being um kind of it you know it's it's it, it was changing hands so many times yeah. that the fact that i was turning in scripts on time uh i think went a long way <laughs> because uh, a lot a lot of my editors didn't really they didn't really like what i was doing <laughs> they just thought it was weird or mm -hmm. oh, i don't get it you know i'm like oh okay but they didn't fire me <laughs> yes. And then fans started really responding to it and and being really kind about it and and it just kind of it just kept it just kept going and I was, yeah. I was, I was thrilled man just kind of snowballed from there well yeah, it seems yeah. like it seems like from doing a little research on you it seems like that's been a kind of constant in your career and yeah. I want to I want to talk about Flash a little bit more but before yeah. that I do something we kind of talk about with all of our guests is kind of their comic origin right mm -hmm. and I saw you talked about that you kind of grew up with comic books making yeah. small movies with your friends and stuff yeah. like that and you mentioned that you always grew up writing so I'm just curious in those early days do you remember like some specific comics that really was like a kind of awakening for you and not only that but like what kind of stuff did you write was it like little scripts I know you're big obviously came from the tv side so yeah. that was always in the cards but where did that really start 
so the real the where it really started was i have a very um tense relationship with my dad we you know it is what it is but like my dad drew some dc comics like a couple of them when i was a kid oh okay and, and then he had drawn some captain adam in the 80s and an alpha flight i think not i think he'd done like 12 books and all or something mm -hmm. but comics were always this kind of like safe my dad was into it mm -hmm. and he was into martial arts and stuff and so that became something i think i gravitated to obviously in retrospect looking at it, it's like oh it's a safe place that we can kind of interact in yeah and uh one of the first books i ever read was a detective comics i was really big into spider-man and and then i was at the age when comics i would you know i pick up anything that came came mm -hmm. into my purview x-men was huge my dad had given me the dark phoenix saga like trade which was weird at the time i was like oh yeah they had trades back then but it was like only certain ones and it's such i still have it i mean like mm. the the spine is completely destroyed <laughs> but like the dark phoenix trade blew my mind mm -hmm. it was during and it, around that time like secret wars had happened and that like just uh, the hulk lifting up the you know the yeah like, oh, you know? <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't like I wasn't the biggest DC guy, though. I would read DC. I would a lot of Batman books, especially. I was into, mm -hmm. but I was I was definitely more geared toward X Men and um, you know Spider Man stuff, especially when after Secret Wars and the symbiote suit and all that stuff was really big. Um, but I found myself really gravitating toward Ditko stuff. So one of the first books I ever got was the Blue Beetle Modern Comics Charlton Comics uh, uh, Ted Cord book which i really loved and mm -hmm. that came around the same time that justice league international came out and that that totally revolutionized because it's like oh this is mm -hmm. funny and mm -hmm. it's exciting and that's weird so the jli anything by mark grunewald which i didn't know at the time i never really paid attention to the writers but i was reading captain america it was captain america no more mm -hmm. uh, when he had to give up his suit and then at the same time peter david was bringing back uh the green hulk after a big run with joe fix it and um it was like during the fall of the mutants mm -hmm. and oh good uh, time good time i mean it was just like everything <laughs> fingers to me it was like Inferno yeah. was over here mm -hmm. and there was an armor wars going on with iron man with the the red and white armor and i was just like i was so engrossed mm -hmm. <laughs> i was just spending every day yeah, yeah yeah i would go down to this little there's this willow creek market and you know it was on a spinner rack and you just mm -hmm. pull what you could get and then and then of course that image re it was right before the image revolution, but when Liefeld and McFarlane, McFarlane was doing Spider-Man. And remember when they did Spider-Man, I, I, everybody probably has a Spider-Man number one. And then all the X-Force number ones, and then the Jim Lee X-Men, those came out. I was a little older then, but it was like, oh my gosh. I mean, and then image just like blew my mind. Mm -hmm. And then I really got into the Chuck Dixon when he was running the bat office. So it was like Nightwing and Robin and you know at the same time birds of prey like so anyways that's kind of my progression of comics. yeah uh but as a kid my big comics were um uh, i like obviously we were all impacted by dark knight returns but for me uh daredevil born again was one of the biggest oh. comic impacts for me mm -hmm. um the mark runewald captain america was huge for me um i love stuff like quasar but i was always in also into quantity not quality so mm -hmm. like i have the entire run of the new universe comics because <laughs> i could get like five of them for the cost of like one yeah and the new universe books were so weird and so yeah. out there and when they found out they were going to be canceled they just went completely crazy like it was yeah. such a cool thing to to witness in real time but anyways yeah. I'm rambling. I don't no, know. No, no, please maybe ramble on. That's another idea of no, this stuff that, in my life. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, like you said, that's kind of you hit like one of the best times in comic books. I mean, with the so X-Men and all that stuff and the birth of image, like that's yeah. historical in you know, comic history. So you really kind of hit the vein early, oh. like right in that formative period. It was but, big. I mean, even the toys, like the superpower toys mm -hmm. on the Eastern side and the Secret War toys on the, the but Marvel, but listen, the other, the other, when I came back to comics was about when Brad Meltzer did the, um, uh, his run of, uh, I can't, I forget of it, but it was the mystery of finding out about uh, elongated man's wife and all that stuff. But I started reading Marvel. I had just said, I just met Joe Casada, and I was like, dude, like that run of civil war leading into secret invasion leading into world war hulk was like nuts just 
just, <laughs> just every i was like oh my gosh how are they they're not friends yeah but <laughs> i was like some of them are scrolls i'm like oh <laughs> so yeah i remember good. the first time i ever read secret invasion it's the same thing i was like what? like what do you mean yeah. like what the hell is a scroll yeah. Yeah. but that's so that's so cool to hear and then like going back to the whole kind of snowballing uh yeah. thing so then after that you went off to college and then you started off criminal justice but then yeah. you found out film was a thing so you're like oh what the hell and yeah. you know jumped into that started working in animation like you said your first uh paid job was for the green lantern animated series yeah, yeah. and by and the way when you say criminal justice it's like it was at orientation. I was yeah, like, yeah. wait, there's a film department? <laughs> here, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what the hell am I doing yeah, here? Yeah. But uh kind of one thing I want to talk about very quickly before we get into you know the animation and stuff like that is something that I kind of when I was doing some research on you, something I really related to with your story. And I think uh something that a lot of people don't really realize or think about is you kind of had a little bit of a long road getting to the animation and stuff. And you talked about how you moved out to LA and you worked a bunch of kind of odd jobs, working at Blockbuster, uh, shooting your shot with Catherine Hagel, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I do my stuff. I do my stuff. But uh, yeah. So like I said, you did like a bunch of odd jobs and then you finally met uh, Jim, your buddy, Jim, who yeah. you is one of your working partners. And you kind of talk about you had this kind of divine intervention moment that I thought was really interesting. So one, can you kind of talk about that a little bit? And the, I guess my question from that is, like I said, I think a lot of people from the outside looking in on the comic book industry or even animation, they're like, oh, this guy writes Green Lantern. You know what I mean? Like this dude's, you know, set, but people don't see the work it took to get there and, you know, the road that it took to get there. So can you just kind of talk about that period a little bit? Yeah. I mean, um, I didn't know anybody out here in LA and, you know, I, I wanted to do movies and film and comics and everything. And you know, I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. You know, and I just came out here. And what I didn't understand is that networking is really important. And I wasn't like the greatest networker mm -hmm. uh, because I uh, also I'm I'm a pretty religious guy. I'm I'm not like I'm not the guy that's going to go out and do coke. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> like, you know, like I I'm I'm also awkward, so I'm not going to be, be cool at parties. Mm -hmm. um, so I came out to L.A. and I really just kept grinding away trying to find jobs and i think i was under the, under the delusion that somebody was just going to pick me out of a crowd and be like hey here's a here is the hey job hey kid you got moxie yeah. <laughs> yeah. and then there was this moment where i was working as an assistant for a producer and he said do you have anything for me to read and i was like oh my gosh i have a lots of bits of things mm -hmm. um and and that was my first revelation was like i got to write something I got to have something ready for when somebody asks, because I can walk around and say, I want to be a writer or a director or whatever, but they're going to be like, oh, what have you directed? What have you written? Mm -hmm. And if you look at them with a blank face, then that's that's not good. Mm -hmm. And so I read Stephen King's book on writing, which was very um, inspirational. And he talked about how he was very workman. He would work like, he would write like eight hours a day. It's crazy. And I was like, I couldn't do that. I go, mm -hmm. maybe I could do an hour, maybe. Mm -hmm. And so I did that. And then suddenly I started turning out scripts. So I have some scripts, but I had been out in LA for probably nine years at that point, trying to break in somehow. Mm -hmm. And my buddy had a, uh, a Doctor Who night. He was a guy from church. I knew that we had this Doctor Who night at this friend's house. And there was a bunch of people. It wasn't just like religious people, you know, watching mm -hmm. Doctor Who. <laughs> um, but there's this guy, Jim, that was there. And we, we, became friendly and then we, every month we would watch it was like when chris eccleston's doctor who showed up and and this one guy we know named nathan would get like the bootlegs or something from europe for some mm -hmm. and um one month he said hey you know what do you want to do i'm like oh i want to be a writer and he's like i'm a writer and i was like uh-huh yeah. you know I, I don't know i don't even know if imdb was there at that time uh -huh. you know <laughs> And I was like, oh, sure you are. Everybody's a writer. He said, let me read something of yours. Well, I had had a script at that point. Mm -hmm. He had read it. I remember him coming back and goes, this is garbage. He goes, but it's good garbage. You know, I was like, oh, whatever. Okay. <laughs> months, months go by, months. 
And mm-hmm. I started dating who would then become my wife. And we were going, we went to church one Sunday and there was a story of the burning bush. And if anybody knows the story of the burning bush, it's like, you know, if you've seen a uh, Prince of Egypt, you know, mm-hmm. it's like uh, God is in the bush and tells Moses he has to go to Egypt to let his captors free. And, and I had said to Amy, uh, I was like, man, that's what I need. I need God to like definitively come and tell me what to do. Like, I don't need a small voice. I need a loud voice. She's like, you should pray about it. And I did. I prayed about mm-hmm. that night. And the next day I get a call from Jim and he goes, I know this is going to be weird, but I was praying last night and I feel like God wants me to be your mentor and I want to put you on the show, but I need you to do this, this, and this. And he gave me like three tasks. Mm-hmm. And I was like, absolutely. That's and crazy. I did them. And, and years later he said, I never, I never wanted i didn't actually want you to do the tasks i wanted to see if you were willing to do the tasks mm-hmm. and um and i did them it was like an extension course at ucla and a couple other things and then i got this job on green lantern the animated series and so it was very divine in a way that I, I, for me it was all the confirmation i needed and so i did an episode of that and then they asked me to do another episode but you know, even then it was like, I was working as an assistant because it takes a, it takes like a year and a half to two years sometimes to have animation done. Mm-hmm. I was working at a toy company uh, as an assistant and um, Jack specific is what it was called. And I kept coming, I was, they would have like all this stuff and I would come up with like, you guys should do a cartoon on based on your ninja costumes. And mm-hmm. I would like, you know, here's, here's a 40 page uh, <laughs> idea. And they're like, who is this person? You know? and, then, and then the green lantern came out and they were like, why aren't you writing on our show? And I'm like, you have, I a don't show. know. Why I'm, am I yeah, not? <laughs> yeah. So they let me write on the show called Monsuno. And then they bumped mm-hmm. me up to assistant producer. And next thing I know, I'm being sent to like Japan or whatever. I'm like, oh my gosh. And it was, it was amazing. But, you know, and I thought, oh, I made it in a mm-hmm. way. And then on a Friday, I found out my wife was pregnant. And on a Monday, the entire department was let go. And, uh, and then that spent, and then I spent almost four years being like at a stay at home dad doing ghost writing and doing like small odd jobs that I could get. And it was tough. Because not only are you exhausted just hanging out with your kid and and doing all the parenting things, Mm -hmm. you're like, I got to pursue this dream that I want to pursue and try to find the energy to do it. And then, you know, living off of one spouse's income, which, you know, we only made that decision because childcare is so expensive. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, okay, you know, and I was, I was, by the end of it, I was really just like, oh, this is not what I want. You know, I love my daughter. I love being the stay-at-home dad, but I was also, oh, I want to do this other thing. And so Jim had landed at Warner Brothers and on Justice League Action. And he's like, hey, would you want to do some of these? So that started my, my journey into not just any, just like Warner Brothers, but like Mm -hmm. I started doing Justice League Action. It was so fun. The scripts were so well received. Um, Alan Burnett, I got to work with Alan Burnett, who's just a, a genius uh, legend from Batman, the animated series days. And mm-hmm. he, like, he was so complimentary to me. And and from there, it was just like, oh, you want to do this little Scooby-Doo thing? It's like, yeah, absolutely. Do you want to do this? And then, and then my big, another changing point was... Uh, uh, they were going to do a Lego DC superhero girls movie. Mm-hmm. And because the DC superhero girls uh, animated thing that Shay Fontana was doing was, was really doing really well. And, um, and so I get a call from Jim and they were like, I was going to give it to someone. Literally. He's like, I was going to give it to someone else, <laughs> uh, but um, they needed it quick. And I, and you're the quickest writer I've ever, I, I know. And so I was like, awesome. So I did this thing. And it was, um, and the and the director ended up leaving partway through it. It was very weird, but mm-hmm. everybody was really pleased with my work, and that started my relationship with Lego. And since then, I've done like, I think I don't know, seven or eight movies with them. You know, yeah. and not just the uh, DC Lego movies, but like uh, some Jurassic World. I have a Jurassic mm-hmm. Lego Jurassic Park retelling coming out this fall. Um, and so Lego, and I, I ran the show called Monkey Kid for three seasons. Mm-hmm. So like I started doing stuff with Lego and I just love those guys over there. And, and they've always been very kind to me and uh, we, we just get along. And uh, so, you know, I, 
I started getting some of that success in, in, in terms of content. I don't know. Mm -hmm. We all have a varying degrees of what we call success. I have <laughs> yeah. a little apartment with one bathroom and two girls. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm, I am doing the stuff I dreamed I could do. And mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's been, it's been thrilling. So all of that to say, I was turning things in on time. I was receptive. I was great to work with and receptive to people's notes. And those are the two biggest barriers to entry, mm -hmm. you know? And um, I think because of that, people kept giving me more and more things. Now it, it also did, it helped that I loved what I was doing and I love nerd <laughs> stuff. Yeah. And like the reason I got, uh, I did Batman Soul of the Dragon with Bruce Tim, And the reason mm -hmm. I did Mortal Kombat is because I wouldn't shut up about mm -hmm. martial arts, uh, A, just martial arts generally, but mm -hmm. also about DC Comics martial arts because DC has this great codified, cool martial art, subculture stuff that they've had yeah. mm -hmm. you know, and, and they've kind of like built out and I, I ate up all of it um so i don't i'd constantly talk about stuff like that so that yeah. got me literally i pitched batman meets enter the dragon for a while and then one one day bruce tim came into a meeting he's like i want to do something that's like kind of enter the dragon with batman and they all went oh you got to talk like, to jeremy yeah, yeah like oh we got the guy for you <laughs> and so then when mortal kombat came up it was like Sam Register was like, everybody's saying that we have to talk to you, mm -hmm. you know, because I'm just talking about fighting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's so awesome to hear. And like I said, I think a lot of people like from the outside looking in think like things like this just kind of happen overnight. Oh. And like I said, I, from reading about you and stuff, I really related to that myself. Yeah. I mean, I didn't come out to LA to be you know like a TV writer or anything okay. but I do you know comic book reviews and obviously I'm doing this podcast right now so yeah. I totally relate to like you were saying like putting in the work and you know yeah. doing the best work you can and just hoping that the right person notices it or you meet the right yeah. person and networking and I think that's a very major part of all this stuff no matter what you're trying to do whether it's yeah. writing or anything creative so yeah. like I said, I just really, I really relate to that. And I think a lot of people, Listen, really, man, I, I think that's that. more the, that's more the norm. Like even in my first, uh, you know, run of with Wally, I would say like, you know, there's this old AA adage, which is like, don't leave before the miracle happens. And, mm -hmm. and I always think about Samuel L. Jackson and Ian McKellen. Like, I guess Ian McKellen was a big theater actor. I had never seen him until he showed up as Magneto yeah and it was like oh, who's this old dude? yeah mm -hmm. and it was like who's this old dude and then samuel jackson had been trying to break in and had bit parts for ages mm -hmm. but it wasn't until pulp fiction that everybody's like oh who's this guy yeah you know? and it's like a lot of these guys that are successful you know like take take ben affleck and matt damon when they won goodwill hunting people were like oh they came out of nowhere it's like those guys were child actors yeah like, they've been doing this for ages mm -hmm. and so there's, there is qual there is something about grinding to do it mm -hmm. that um you just got to keep going if it's what you want to do i mean i made sure i was totally inept at every other job so there's only <laughs> one one way yeah. <laughs> <you know. laughs> yeah and i think too i mean even just the process of that like that whole time you were honing your skills you were developing your you know avenues your voice and all that stuff and i i'm sure that you would agree that was probably very vital to the way that you do stories now it was very vital. There was a lot of life experience that helps mm -hmm. inform a lot of the stories that I write. But also, I I honestly think I'm I'm very grateful. I, you know, I'm always like, why didn't God? Why didn't you give me success in my twenties? And God's <laughs> like, because you would have squandered every bit of it. <laughs> We're ready for it. <laughs> and that is that's the truth. I mean, yeah. I would have been like, look at me, and I would have said terrible things, and like, you know, <laughs> and, and I would have been canceled before it started. <laughs> It wasn't until I had a little wisdom under my belt and a little empathy under under my belt that like you just realize like I have a lot of gratitude mm -hmm. to where to me being able to do this stuff because it's not it's other people's things it's other people's toys yeah I'm really grateful I get to play with them but at any time they can pull them away you mm -hmm. know and that's yeah. just the, that's the reality. Yeah, and I mean speaking of playing with other people's toys and we're talking about the animation stuff. Uh, something I really wanted to ask you, like I said, you're basically like the DC animated guy these days. Like you ah. did Super Sons, you did you got War World that just came out, uh, Action, game. Green Lantern, all the Lego stuff. I mean, the Bruce Tim stuff you just mentioned. Yeah. And I mean, for me, and I know for a fact, it's a lot of people, especially around my age group, 
the DC animated stuff, like that was instrumental for yeah. my like comic upbringing. And I know it was for a lot of people. And like I said before, everyone out there knows, you know, jokingly, I'm the Marvel shill and I'm the <laughs> Marvel guy. But yeah. DC animation has been the gold standard, I think, un yeah. unequivocally since it began. I mean, you got the Super Friends, the Wonder yeah. Twins, even like the yeah. old stuff like that. And then, like I said, the Batman animated, Superman animated series. Yeah. So being a fan and being, like you said yourself, a super nerd, what does it feel like? Is it kind of like daunting a little bit uh, to have, does it feel kind of like a weight on your shoulders a little bit? Like br being that for the next generation and knowing like these cartoons, just like for me and for other people introduced us to comic books and the DC world. Do you ever think about that when you're doing these animated stuff? No, I'm thinking about. It. I hope I don't get bad notes. You know? <laughs> uh, no, I because I'm. I will tell you. Yes, in comic books, but in animation, it was like uh, one of the things that Warner Brothers did right is that Sam Register really took the creatives and let them have a lot of freedom to mm -hmm. do this stuff. I was just talking with somebody who was talking about how all their scripts were rewritten, uh, you know, from head to tail by the time it got to air, and I was like, that's never been my experience there have been rewrites and stuff and there have been weird production things we've had to change. And I feel like the things that got were the least successful of mine were because there wasn't a clear vision going in or whatever, but I found mm -hmm. such incredible collaborators, whether it was with Jim or with Rick Morales, which Rick and I have done a great many movies like, like war world. I did a segment of it, but like with Rick, I did, you know, I did super sons, all the mortal Kombat movies, all the DC Lego uh movies mm -hmm. and um and that's been that's been an incredible partnership and jim has always been uh, a, a producer on those things i never thought about it as like oh i wonder you know this is the next thing for the next year it was more like we always thought about like i wonder if we can get away with some of the stuff we want to get away <laughs> with in things you know yeah and like, like super sons we were just excited about the idea of doing super sons rick had come to me and he said oh, i want to do a super sons thing and i hadn't read it Mm -hmm. and so he'd give me the trade of Tomasi and um and I read it, I was like oh my gosh that'd be incredible and we kept trying to get it done but the theatrical animation arm called WAG they were going to do it and um so we weren't allowed to do it so for like two two plus years we would have lunch and we'd be like wouldn't it be funny if like Damien had to come to John's school and like <laughs> blah, blah, blah. and we just kept coming up with scenes mm -hmm. and there was this one moment where at t right when at t bought Warner Brothers that Rick was in a meeting and they were doing something else and he said I don't guys Jeremy and I have been wanting to do this super sons thing for a long time can we just do that and for whatever weird hiccup mm -hmm. they said yes and we knew that we had to do it quickly because we knew they were going to, we were afraid that the theatrical arm was going to come back to life and shut us down. Mm -hmm. And so I had that outline done in like two days because I, we'd already mapped out the, the movie. Yeah. And, um, I don't think about it. I think about, Oh my gosh. Uh, like that and soul of the dragon, um, this upcoming Johnny cage movie. Like there are certain movies I've done that I just sit there and I go, it doesn't matter if people hate it. I love it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just thrilled. I don't think about like, in terms of, I want to make something that's a little different. I want to make something that's a lot of fun for people to watch that has a lot of, um, you know, just messages and just, just fun. Like everybody, yeah. can watch it, everybody can. But the thing is, I don't think about how it's going to, now when I went from the flash to green lantern, I really felt the weight of that. And uh, I felt the weight because Flash was really well received, mm -hmm. and um, and then it was like, is it, it, the weight of is it just a one trick? Is he just a one trick pony? Mm -hmm. And um, as as complicated as the mythology of the Flash is, I would say that the Green Lantern mythology might be even more complicated. And um, luckily, you know, I had just gotten to know Jeff Johns. Uh, quite well and he was he was so great and so when i was really sad about leaving the flash but they had given me um green lantern and i was just like, oh, no, no. You know? <laughs> he, he was so pumped for me 
Mm-hmm. It gave me enough like energy to be like, okay, I could do this. You yeah. Know? But I was, I'm, I'm really scared about it. You know, I'm mm-hmm. still scared about it. I'm scared every time a comic comes out. Every time I turned in a, a, um, a script to my editors, I'm like, oh, yeah. I hope they don't kill me here. You know. <laughs> uh, so there's a lot of imposter syndrome swimming around. But I, mm-hmm. I did feel a lot of like, there was a change. There was a change just in the way that people reacted to me when I went from the Flash to Green Lantern. And, um, and I felt, I felt the weight of that. And I felt Mm -hmm. like, oh gosh. And you're also dealing with Green Lantern has been so, you know, Jeff and Pete Tomasi and Venditti, like even Grant Morrison, they've done these crazy runs on, on Green Lantern. They've done these incredible, you know, huge cosmological giant things it's like what oh i'm just gonna tell a story about hell on earth for now you know <laughs> and then like build up to something and mm. I, the only thing i the advantage i have is that i i i like to be stupid and like like <laughs> silly little things uh-huh. and i think humor goes a long way but yeah I, that's where it was intimidating it wasn't mm. so much animation the animation stuff uh animation is um it's not as low paying as comic books but it's pretty low paying uh <laughs> And so there's a little bit of like, you're just, and I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted people to know, like you take jobs. You're like, I want to, I want this job. I mean, Mm -hmm. and you get excited about the job and, and you're like, Oh, I love this paycheck, but that paycheck is not that much. So you have to find another job, you know, every three months you're like looking for another (laughs) thing. And, um, it changed when I went from animation and then I went into live action. Like when I went to supernatural, I was like, Oh, this is different. Mm -hmm. Like this is different in terms of money and respect and prestige was drastically different even though i would say in my experience animation writing is a harder thing to do than live action writing why why would you say that is in your opinion at least my opinion uh maybe because i'm not that much of a dramaturge i guess like (laughs) but um in animation oh something always has to keep happening Mm -hmm can have people just talking but i think people get really bored in animation because you don't have the benefit of a real life actor emoting and giving nuances and stuff like that all the time Mm -hmm. but in animation things have to keep moving you have to keep you know stuff has to keep happening and when you're writing it you have to write the beats of an action not all the time but you write the beats of an action scene of a fight scene you do write camera a lot of camera stuff uh, because your job is to build a blueprint for these the storyboard guys mm-hmm. and to help them be able to do a storyboard. So you can you have a lot more leeway, but you have to be a little more detailed. In fact, they always say like one page equals one minute in sort of the live action, but uh, one and a half page in animation is more um, live a- is more one minute. So uh, my my uh, animation scripts always end up being a little longer mm-hmm. because you have to be, you have to call out things you don't want to miss in the storyboards that you have to uh, slug line and dialogue uh, sounds. So if somebody gets punched, you need to be like, oh, you need to write that out <laughs> yeah. at, the, at the at the voice record. So mm-hmm. there's a lot more work in involved in that uh, hmm. versus when I was on Supernatural, I had literally written out an entire fight scene uh, with Dean and, <laughs> and, you know, Jensen Ackles and Christian Kane. And Bob Singer, the executive producer, was like, why Why did you write this out? And I was like, <laughs> uh, because I thought it would be helpful. He's like, no, we hire people to do this. <laughs> we got just a guy write, for that. Yeah, just write fight scene. I'm like, okay, <laughs> okay you know. So that's hilarious. It like, yeah, it was funny. It was like, mm-hmm. you know, the learning curve. It was different. Yeah, that's super, super oh. interesting, though. Because, I mean, I was that's one of my questions I was going to ask. I'm sure that there's difference. I mean, it's all writing at the end of the day, but I'm sure when you're writing a script for animation versus a script for uh, something live action versus a comic book script, I'm sure those are all very different from each other. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And also, by the way, I'm so, I'm so like, you know, maybe not diagnosed ADD, but I get so (laughs) bored. Oh, you and me both, brother. I I'm with you. I'm ADD too. There's some people that can write uh, scripts and they, and they can have a great time writing just people talking. I'm like, somebody better fight a dragon. (laughs) Somebody better punch someone in the face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because otherwise I'll be like, oh, come on, let's, let's move it along. Move it along. And you can tell, you can tell, like you can see my supernatural episodes and it's like, 
uh, you know, there is no prolonged scene. <laughs> we're talking. It's like, oh, um, gotta jump up ahead. Oh, yeah. Sing. No oh, heart to heart ahead. with the brothers in your episodes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, I do cool. want to talk about Supernatural though, because yeah. I, so I am a huge Supernatural fan. Or yeah. I, I, to be fair, I'll say I was a huge Supernatural fan. Yeah. I like. I had the first five seasons on DVD. Yeah rewatched yeah. them over and over again like i loved it so when i saw that you worked on supernatural i was super pumped to talk to you sure. about that and so so uh when i was looking up i was a little confused so you were you wrote two episodes fully on season 15 and then you were story editor on the whole season correct so story editor is just a uh it is like a it's like a tier of writer mm -hmm. so so i i i didn't have anything to do with i mean by the function when they hired me at 15 they're like we just want you to do a couple of weird episodes okay. so like, you know i credited it on every episode but i don't, mm -hmm. we, don't we didn't have a writer's room okay so i don't have anything to do with um the stories mm -hmm. except other than mine you yeah know? i was just yeah. curious because i know that you talked about that you were a big supernatural fan but Huge. like before you got onto the show yeah. so just curious how it felt for a show that had gone on for so long, right. how did it feel right. to be involved with that final season uh, and like telling the kind of final chapter of the Winchesters? Because I mean, well, they, what, they yeah. have been through it, my yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. They have been through it. So what did that? What was that like? So it, it is interesting because I remember when the first episode came on. I remember watching it and be like, "Oh my gosh, this is my show!" Because I yeah, love same and X Files, and I was like, "It's two bros driving a muscle car, listening to classic rock. This is made for me," you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and then my buddy, Andrew, uh, dab who became the showrunner, he got on an, on season four. And I remember he, he came out to LA. I took him to Sizzler. I remember being, I was so <laughs> excited for him, but I was like totally jealous too, you mm -hmm. know? And, um, and I love, I love the show. And, um, so when they said, Hey, I was supposed to come on season 14, but, um, they were going to do a spinoff show with, with, um, these girls, and it was all but supposed to be happen. And then at the last second, they said, no, they're not going to do it. So I didn't get to go on that season. I was like, bum. Mm -hmm. So I got to do a 15th season. And what was funny was, I mean, I didn't realize people were only pitching like two ideas at a time. I was pitching, the first time I pitched, I pitched 10 ideas. And it was like, oh, here's the least crazy to the craziest. And I said my mm -hmm. least crazy. And they were like, that's too crazy. And I was like, oh, no. Right, well, and, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So every one of those 10 ideas was too crazy. And and so I had this kind of roadhouse idea in the back of my pocket that I did that ended up being the one with Christian Kane where they sang the Dukes of Hazard theme song and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the one they did. And then the second time I pitched uh, again, I was like, okay, Jeremy, only pitch two, only pitch two. And I pitched <laughs> like five. I tried to <laughs> maybe like super who lock. I was like, we could get David Tennant. Like mm -hmm. I was like, I was really swinging for the fences. And by the time my last pitch, I had probably 26 ideas up on my board that I was like, oh my gosh, we could do this or we could do this. Cause I was, I was not stingy with ideas. I never have been. I feel like ideas just come and, and, and you try to throw them out. Yeah. But it was cool to be able to do, I wasn't burdened by trying to do the overarching plot or any of the, um, the stuff that was going on because also uh, I was, I would, I would have loved to have been consulted. I, I'm like, you know, oh, you could do this or you could do this, you know, like yeah. there are things, but I also realized that wasn't my place. I was a lower mm -hmm. level writer. Um, and my job was to kind of execute the two ideas that they agreed on. And, um, but I went up to Vancouver and for each time and got to hang out and meet the crew who are the nicest people in the world. And they're a family. I mean, they've been doing mm -hmm. this for so long. And yeah. seeing like Jensen and Jared and Misha and all those guys that work there, so professional, so incredible and um, incredibly talented. And it was just a, it was such a thrill. I mean, I, there's, it is a totally different dynamic than writing comics or writing animation. Um, but to work on a show that you love because usually the shows don't last that long right yeah uh, and here's a show that's been going on 15 years mm -hmm. when i was just daydreaming about working on a show like that now i get to work on the show you know full faith and credit to andrew for bringing me on and again that's another show that i was lucky enough to go on because of animation 
mm-hmm. because of Scooby Doo, because I was pitching a Scooby Doo supernatural crossover in the animation side for a couple of years, and them telling me it was the stupidest idea they'd ever heard. <laughs> and, and which Jim, I think that's such a gene. Like that's one of those <laughs> ideas. When I saw that, I was yeah. like, "How has no one thought of this?" Yeah, like, I know. I know. Oh, and then, I and then Jim it. said, "Well, you know, Andrew, call him up, see if you if he will do it as a as one of their episodes." And he was so on board. Within a half an hour, we had that thing wrapped up, and um, and we kept thinking it was one of the best experiences I ever had. Where we'd get on notes calls, and there were no notes. Mm-hmm. They were like, "Oh, this is really funny," and we'd be like waiting for them but there was no but it was yeah page 36 i was laughing and you're like that's it like (laughs) it was insane insane. and then because jim is the way he is he's like we got to go up to vancouver we got to go up to vancouver and so they let us go up to vancouver and and then jim jim very loudly was like we got to get on screen we got to get you know and then i saw you back there (laughs) but that's all jim that's all Uh jim just like totally like let's do it you know that's so awesome so it was really really cool i will say that in my second episode that i did i was like uh not the mrs butter but the christian game one i kept trying to convince them to let like have somebody smash a bottle over my head like (laughs) like a bar i wanted to be thrown out the window i was like yeah can you and they're like no oh come on man (laughs) come on let me do it let me do it yeah andrew was like no jeremy put me in coach yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) I was totally ready. I was totally yeah. ready. And that's awesome. And I, like I said, not only was that a genius idea, I think, but I absolutely loved that episode. I loved oh, what the thing I really liked about it and kind of what I wasn't expecting was you still took it seriously. Like right. you would a regular supernatural show. Like when I saw the Scooby-Doo thing, I'm automatically thinking like, you know, Batman and Scooby-Doo right. where yeah, like, yeah, they, yeah. yeah, like they get sucked into the quirkiness of the Scooby-Doo yeah. world, but you kind of flipped it on its head where the Scooby-Doo world gets caught up in the quirkiness of the supernatural right. world, which I right. thought was really, really smart. And I mean, just like the stuff with Dean and the, what is it? The little <laughs> handkerchief thing. Yeah. 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 The that's so, yeah. yeah, yeah. That guy, that's so funny. But I yeah, mean, I loved it, dude. I thought that was so cool. And, and everybody up and down, we had to write that like a year in advance because of animation. And Spike Brandt, who did the animation directing, like the first time he showed us a cut, we we absolutely could not believe they were letting us get away with the violence. In yeah, the that was another thing that surprised me. I was like, oh shit, that, they should have stabbed that dude. Surprised you, man. <laughs> it surprised all of us. We were like, and I remember because the guy who, who's kind of the 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 caretaker of scooby at warner we mm-hmm. thought oh he's shutting us down and he's yeah. like yeah let's do it and we're like, like <laughs> no way you know? that's so awesome and uh, uh like i said i really enjoyed the episode and i just thought it was so smart the way that you guys executed it and okay. uh I just love the like how they're having like an existential crisis yeah. <laughs> like at the end it just <laughs> it's just so good i really that's loved it so good but uh, I got another question about your time on Supernatural. Just really quickly, I got to ask, yeah. as a fan, did you get to sit in the car? Did you see the car? Oh, oh dude. I got pictures in the car. Oh, I man. Like I said, I was, I was, was, this is kind of embarrassing to admit, but I'll, you know, put myself out to the world for you, Jeremy. I was such a Supernatural nerd, dude. Like, I was literally, like, looking, like, at car listing. When yes. I was, like, I was, like, 12 years old. And now we're near yeah. getting a license. Yeah. And I'm looking at 67 Impala. Yeah. My dad's, like, yeah. you're not going to even be able to drive that around. Yeah. Like, that's an old ass car. I was like, I do not care. I was, like I said, so obsessed with it. So, like I said, Dang, that's dude. so I mean, awesome to talk to you see, about it. it. Basically, I did the same. I do the same thing as I do in comic books. Like, on the last episode, I remember thinking, I remember thinking, like, why haven't they used Thor's hammer from mm-hmm. the show? And I was like, they, this is crazy. This thing can kill gods, and they're not using it. And I was so I have this montage in the last episode with Miss, or the episode, the last episode I wrote, where it like starts out with them busting open the door with knives, and then they bust open the door with like a grenade la- or like uh, guns. And then the last one is like Dean grenade launches the door open, and he walks in with a grenade launcher, but uh, Sam has Thor's hammer. And I was oh, like, oh yeah. man, I didn't I even. Like, re- I'm just doing callbacks to other <laughs> because I kept going like, well, where's Thor's hammer? Like, yeah. I don't understand, you know? So. That's hilarious. I didn't even, as the Thor guy, I didn't even yeah, realize yeah. that was yours. Yeah, <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. We got to talk about Flash. We talked about it a little yeah. bit, you know, here yeah. and there as we've been talking. But like I said, so the past couple of days, I have devoured your flash run unfortunately the dc app cut me off (laughs) right before so i think i have like maybe six or seven i'm like 
right at the end of uh, the One Minute War, which oh, okay, so you haven't even gotten Omega Bam Man yet. No, or yeah, yeah, I did Omega Bam oh, did Man. Yeah, oh, oh yeah, was that before? The, the wrestler. Oh. Yeah, that's a couple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's I'll guy. let you know. It was a couple issues before that, Jeremy. But yeah, okay, uh, <laughs> I, it's, all, it's all blurry to me. Yeah, yeah. but man, I re- and like we talked about before, I usually read Marvel, and I have yeah. been reading more DC lately. But I, I've always loved the Flash. Actually, yeah. one of the first. Uh, comics i started like pulling like week by week wow. or month by month was i i forget what exactly what it was called but it was with uh Bear, bart allen when he became oh, yeah. the flash the fastest yeah. man alive yeah. and i love like i guess it was like one of the first books i ever started pulling so i really love the flash so not only did i love your run but it was just so nice getting back into that vein of yeah. like the superhero world and there's all these like cool and fun speedsters now that yeah. like i yeah, yeah. didn't know about i'm like oh who's this person oh who's this person so it was a super fun read and you kind of talked about this a little bit but you can tell that you pull a lot from your life in, yeah. <laughs> in your stories i mean you kind of said it yourself perfectly earlier when you were talking about how when you were a stay-at-home dad for a little bit how yeah. you were so tired and you literally have like a whole issue about wally <laughs> being tired and being a yeah. stay-at-home dad yeah. so i just want to ask uh you also had said when you came to the end of the flash yeah. you felt very like personally connected with wally oh, yeah. and especially yeah. like the kids yeah. And we actually just had, I guess, one of your coworkers, you could say, uh, Jackson Lansing on uh, a oh, couple, yeah. couple weeks ago. And he was talking about when he was writing Captain America, it almost felt like Cap was like talking to him when he was writing. Yeah. So yeah. when you're writing The Flash, and like I said, you're obviously putting a lot of yourself into Wally and in the yeah. family aspect of that. Did you feel that kind of, I guess you could say like cosmic connection with the, with Wally or any of these characters, like you feel like they're like real people, like when you're writing them, you get what, does that make sense? Yeah, no, no, totally. And that was, I think that that was the, that was the hardest part about being told I was taken off was that one of the things I had to assure fans when I got put on was I was like, my job Wally is not going to be, he's not going to be a pinata because mm-hmm. you know, as a character, he had been, there had been a lot of trauma uh, mm-hmm. leading up. And I was like, no, I want to do this, this kind of like throwback old school comic book run and have a lot of fun with it. And, and, and it was surprising to me. So like, I, I did put a lot of myself into Wally cause I could understand a lot of that stuff, but then I didn't realize how, how he was in such a s- similar stage of life as I was. Mm-hmm. And it was like, oh, he has these two kids and I'm looking at my two kids and <laughs> and he has this amazing smart wife and I'm looking at my amazing smart wife and I'm like, oh, this is becoming exponentially easier. Yeah. You know? And the thing that, that flipped me out was how uh, I became so attached, not just to Wally, but the kids. I really became attached to Jay and Irie and Maxine in a way that I was like, oh my gosh. So like literally the first thing out of my mouth when they said, hey, we're going to take you off this book. I was like, are the kids going to be okay? Like that was like the first yeah. thing. Out. And even saying it now is so silly, you know, <laughs> I'm like, oh, they're fictional kids. It's fine. You know, it's all fiction. Mm-hmm. But in my head, I, um, I put so much heart into them and I was making a comic that was kind of a safe place for people to go. Like mm-hmm. I had comic book stores tell me that they could tell parents, like your kid could read the flash and it'd be fine. Mm-hmm. Like it's not, gonna, it's not gonna be too violent. It's not gonna be overtly sexual or whatever. You know, it's it's a comic, it's like a classic comic book um, thing. And And I really wanted to make something that was kind of like not edgy. Mm-hmm. you know and and because i was just looking at the landscape and i was like that's what everybody's doing mm-hmm. and so by virtue of that i ended up becoming very attached to the characters and when i would write i knew the voice i was writing in i wouldn't say that it was like oh wally would tell me this but i knew what wally would say mm-hmm. and i found myself being attached to like oh mr terrific and like <laughs> you know, like and now mr terrific has a kid like all this stuff yeah. that and it's funny because I remember getting some flack for like, oh, Mr. Terrific has a kid. And I was like, you got to understand, Young Justice was grown up. Like mm-hmm. the Young Justice are older. And at the time I wanted, there was a space for like another, like a kid group because there were no kid groups. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that Jeff was going to bring back 12 sidekicks in you know, <laughs> uh, Stargirl. Uh, 
And I was like, oh, but there are these other characters that we could play with that we could that. And that's why I brought the Super Sons from another mm -hmm. universe that were young still. And and I wanted to start my own show. Anyways, to answer your question, I, I didn't I don't think I had that cosmic connection, but I just knew the character that I wanted to write and the stories I wanted to write. And I was very attached to it. And it was it, it's it's really hard. But what's great is I just heard from people like you, Mark Wade. It's like nobody well they mark Wade's never been kicked like you know told that they're moving on mm -hmm. um, um and i did and it was like you know i was just bummed because i you know i thought the book was doing really well and it was doing really well but they wanted to go in a new direction and and, and it's not mine you mm -hmm. know the hardest part for me like it was sad to leave the characters the hardest part for me was not being able to tell people and that that was hard because I'm a close the loop person. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I felt like it was all lingering and I, and I couldn't concentrate on green lantern because I was still thinking about these characters, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I, I got a bit of trouble. Everybody was like, Oh, you're sad. I'm like, yeah, I'm sad. because <laughs> Like I'm happy and so grateful. I even said that in the thing. It's mm -hmm. like, I'm so grateful that I've had the chance to, to play with the West, but I'm absolutely sad because I love playing with the, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. like, mm -hmm. it's like, you let me play and now you're saying I can't do that. And I was like, oh man, you know, Yeah. but uh, that's okay. I think mm -hmm. Simon Spurrier is going to do something that is completely different. And, um, and uh, you know, he is a much more intelligent writer than I could ever be. I just want to punch <laughs> people in the nuts. And, like, you know, have like, <laughs> missions and the yeah, uh, super galactic wrestling matches yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. yeah. And then, there's room for both and, though yeah yeah exactly yeah. and so like even with how how uh my green lantern is much more serious than the flash it's still mm -hmm. fun but it's much more serious in tone the flash just lent itself to this kind of like just weirdo like you could do anything <laughs> you know yeah like, well, that's... like the the caveman speedster and the and the raptor like Ugg yes. and like i'm like Ugg and swoosh are still out there guys like mm -hmm. you know <laughs> yeah like... and i love that and that's one of the things i really loved about this run and you said it perfectly is it does give me that kind of classic comic book feel right. and don't get me wrong i love the newer comics and the more kind yeah. of cinematic and event kind of stuff but this really did feel like almost like a saturday morning cartoon where right. like you had you had really great arcs like the gem gem city uh right. gem, gem, gem uh gem uh sorry amethyst planet of gem world yeah yeah gem world you got the gem world you got obviously the one minute war you have the stuff uh like you said with uh wally going back in time and the right. really emotional arc that i really loved with uh red arrow or arrow i yeah, forget yeah. what he goes by but yeah. you still had all that great stuff in there but like i said it was still just it was fun it was quirky yeah. it was wally doing adventures and like we were just uh talking about the galactic wrestling match like that whole <laughs> issue is just pure fun and like i just really loved that and one issue that i thought speaking of fun was just like i thought was so awesome and i like one of the most creative things i've ever read was your issue with dr fate uh, yeah. I forget exactly <laughs> what number it is. Uh, yeah, it's like 776, I think. Yeah, like, like in the seven, 770s, yeah. somewhere around there. But basically, it's like an interactive comic book issue yeah. where Dr. Faye literally like pulls the panel back and is like, we need your help. Yeah, totally. was, as soon as I saw that, I was like, oh, hell yeah. Like, let's yeah. go. Can you talk a little bit about like what the how you came up with that idea for oh, that man. issue? That, and like, that, that was, was so cool. cool. That was percolating in my head forever. I had always imagined as a Doctor Strange episode or Doctor mm -hmm. Strange book because I was a big Doctor Strange fan. Yeah. And so as I was getting close to this, and then uh, I was like, "Oh, I could use I I could do Doctor Fate." And then it was just like, "I wonder if they'll let me do this thing, you know, that I've been wanting to do for ages." Because I because as a stay at home dad, you read a lot of kids books, and there's a lot of kids books that are kind of like similar to that. Like, mm -hmm. oh, make sure you clap your hands and stuff, you know. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, cool. And I was like, gosh, that would be so much fun as a comic book. And uh, so it's not like, you know, overtly original idea, but I, I loved it as being like a, like just, I wanted people to be engaged in it and kind of believe the 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 magic, the, the you know, the, yeah. the house of cards and having Dr. Fate do that. But what was so fun was Fernando Pastor, who's one of my favorite 
artists ever. And he's one of those guys that can kind of read my mind. And he kept just bringing back these pages that were just so amazing. I think what was fun about it is not only are we doing the thing where you have to turn the page or you have to blow on the page or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then we added in that thing at the end. It's like, did you see the glyphs? Like, yeah, you know, like, I only found one. I mean, that's so funny. I, <laughs> he sent the art back to me and I was like, I can't find a darn one of these. <laughs> and he pointed them out. I was like, oh my gosh, they're there. But people were having so much fun with that book. And they, they were telling me how much they went back and they were looking and they spent, they've never spent that much time with a comic book. Mm -hmm. And it was so gratifying because it was like, you're really searching this book. And and I had to print it out on paper and I had to arrange it and I had to videotape myself. Like, this is how it needs to be printed, mm -hmm. you know? And when they screwed it up the first time, like, no, you know? And I begged them to put a disclaimer at the beginning, uh, if people are reading it digital, lock their, lock their- Yeah, camera. see, that's what I did. And it screwed me up at first. Cause I was like, wait, counterclockwise. I'm like, that doesn't yeah, that's yeah. So they, <laughs> so they didn't do it. And I was like, oh, it drove me nuts. And even when it came out in floppies, I was so mad because it'd be like, turn the book. And then they'd put a house ad. And I'd be like, are you kidding me, guys? <laughs> oh, yeah. So Come like in, in the trade, it, it plays much better. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it was, it was again, one of those things that I thought, I had done up to that point, I had done, you know, this quantum leap arc and I had done this uh, issue where Kevin McGuire drew like 10 pages where he jumped in reverse flashes body. And yeah, it, was, yeah. it was really, really silly, like super silly. And I, but I was I such a McGuire it. fan. I was like, I won. Like, I was just <laughs> thinking I won. They can fire me. It doesn't matter. I got this. <laughs> and then they were okay with it. It was really well received. And I was like giggling to myself. And I'm like, what other weird things can I do? You know, <laughs> so I did that one. And then, you know, I wrote one with my daughter. And then, um, you know, having Gold Beetle come in and 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 having Omega Bam Man, like all that mm -hmm. stuff was just like, will they let me do this? You know, <laughs> and they, they've always been, I, I have to give them a lot of credit. They've been really kind to let me just try weirdo things, you know. Mm. Yeah. And I, like I said, I absolutely loved it. That was like one of the most creative, engaging comics. I, I'm I, I'm going on eBay later today to hunt uh, a, a floppy edition of it because I need yeah. that in my collection because it was yeah, just, no, it's, it you, was so man. fun. It was awesome. Like that's, that's like, I mean, you can tell even if it's Scooby Doo, Na Scooby Natural or that or some of the things I do in Mortal Kombat. Like I try to look for the different angle, like what's going to be the weird mm -hmm. or like the kind of side thing that we can do that makes it different because i want people yeah. to have a different experience than just i don't want them to necessarily know what's going to happen you know mm -hmm. what i mean yeah and i'm sure that also gets hard when you're writing characters like yeah. superman and flash and right. batman who have been around for like a hundred years at this point so to keep things fresh and like you I, you keep using the word weird but i mean i think it's right. more innovative you know what i mean it's like everything that's weird well everything was weird at one point before right. you know you did it the first time right, so right, right i think right, that's right. a i think that's a really fresh and uh like refreshing approach that Thank i think you. some people you know would play it safe and be like oh right. like i'm doing wally west i'm doing the flash like i need to stay in this kind of box or this kind of lane so yeah. i appreciate especially your work and any writer when I love big swings. I love people going for the fences. Like, dude, let's get freaking weird with it, man. Like yeah. I love that stuff. And I think you do that very well, but in a way that it feels natural. Like right. I didn't, when I'm reading while the, the flash, I'm not thinking like, wow, this is just absurd. Like it fits <laughs> in the story. It fits in the right. world. And that's what makes it so good. And we talked, you talked about this very briefly, but I wanted to ask you this a little bit more in detail. You talked about how it was now you're writing Green Lantern, which we're going to get to next. But you talked about how the lore and like mythology of Green Lantern is even more so than the Flash. Yeah. Yeah. But I, from reading your Flash, I was very interested. And like I said, I am, I was a big Flash fan growing up and stuff. I know, you know, the basics and whatnot. Yeah. But the Flash mythology is very rich, and especially yeah. with the Speed Force, and it's kind of a running joke in comic books, like, oh, how fast is the Flash? Oh, however yeah. fast the writer needs him to be, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So my question is, you you deal a lot with the Speed Force in your run, yeah. and you even, yeah. like, even the dialogue is very, like, nitty gritty with kind of Speed Force details yeah. and, like, how that all works. So what was your kind of research process like when you took on the Flash 
And obviously DC has been through a lot of, you know, crises, reboots and whatnot. So where did you kind of focus that lens for how you wanted to depict the speed force in your run? Because obviously, like I said, every writer kind of, I feel, interprets it their own way. Yeah, yeah. So how, what lane did you kind of focus on when uh, developing that? So as I was, as I was starting to write the flash, I was doing deep dives and reading a lot of Mark Wade and Jeff Johns or whatever, you know, Mm -hmm. just trying to get, up to speed <laughs> and yeah. uh, uh you know <laughs> and, yeah exactly and <laughs> and so all i knew was that i i thought the flash was really intimidating because i was like how is to me he's the most overpowered powerful creature in in the universe mm-hmm. because i'm like if if force equals mass times acceleration and you have infinite acceleration i don't see how anybody could beat him and that became the challenge so i was like i need to do a doctor who version of the flash yeah. So it's not just about him fighting a guy that's throwing a boomerang. It's like, he's so empathetic. He slows down to talk to somebody. And that is, his empathy is also his weakness. It slows him down long enough for somebody to knock him on the head, you know, potentially. Yeah. Um, but with the speed force, I, I just kept, when I first took over, the the corporate mandate was everything had happened. And so everything in continuity had happened, which doesn't, logically make any sense whatsoever yeah. and um and then and then within a month i think they changed it but i was already committed uh and 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 there was a flash forward book where wally had come back and he had gotten into metron's chair and he was helping the um i forget his name to fix things and knit back the universe and i thought oh my gosh the speed force goes through all dimensions history and time i go what if speedsters are their conduits for this speed force but what if it allows them to remember? What if Wally remembers the reboots and remembers all the stuff? And that that fits into continuity in terms of that's why in Heroes in Crisis, he was having such a crisis because he remembered he had a family that was wiped out of existence. It's the reason that he you know, brought things back. And I thought, oh, this is really cool. So now you have a character that not just has infinite you know, acceleration, has infinite empathy. And potentially might be the reason the person who created the universe. I don't know. Uh, but, <laughs> but I love the idea that he knows. He knows the secret, that he knows all the different versions of the universe. And this is the 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 version he is in. And that's because of the speed force. And and so I love the idea of the speed force being this thing that could be harnessed. And it's been touched on by so many different people. But I liked I liked codifying it in a way which led to obviously the um the one minute war. And then after that you haven't gotten there yet but you know the <laughs> idea mr terrific is like oh okay the speed force works like this it's like it's like nuclear energy that we could we could literally harness but there are people potentially metas that can harness it organically and that's that's different mm-hmm. so um it just made it because i want it all to make logical sense in my head it makes yeah. it easier for me to write when i know the rules mm-hmm. so that's kind of that's kind of how i looked at it yeah, I mean, with something like the Speed Force, like like you said, knowing the rules, I can only imagine how hard it was to nail down those rules. Like, yeah, yeah, okay, like, yeah. I mean, I'm sure people could find holes, but I, I think that's why even like you can see when I did the One Minute War, I really expound upon it. It's mm-hmm. like, okay, here's this: the fraction uses the Speed Force like we would use jet fuel. You yeah. know, they've just figured out a way to harness it, and that makes them incredibly dangerous. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. Oh, man, I love that. I love that so much. And then before we get on to the Green Lantern stuff, uh, just yeah. very quickly. So in your Flash run, you wrote a lot of people in there. Like you, yeah. I mean, basically, you <laughs> wrote basically every speedster, I think that exists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm curious, obviously, I know that Wally obviously has a special place in your yeah. heart. So besides Wally, who was one of your favorite uh, Flashes to write when you were doing your run, even if it was just like a very quick, like, uh, it's uh, Irie for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, Irie was like, uh, like I said, I, I gravitated toward the kids uh, a great deal. I mm-hmm. loved writing her. I love the scene in One Minute War where she uses Jay as a battering ram, and she's just <laughs> like knocking. I was like, this is so lunatic, and I, <laughs> um, I found myself really liking Liberty Bell. Uh, mm-hmm. I was just like, oh, 
I didn't know much about her. I mean, I'd seen her in like JSA stuff. And I, mm-hmm. and then the more I deep dive, I was like, oh, that's cool. So uh, when I did the search for Barry Allen, it was Liberty Bell and Max uh, Mercury. I was like, oh, these guys are really, really cool. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's hard. You're asking me to ask between my children. I'll say I really, <laughs> the, other thing, the other thing that surprised me was how much I, how much I enjoyed writing Ace because up until then, I, I didn't really understand the character. Like they created this character to diversify Wally and mm-hmm. then they changed it to be like, okay, that's not Wally. And so then it's like, well, what's, what's his place in the world? Mm-hmm. And I, I'm a firm believer of like, I, I want, I want to, how can I make this character somebody I, I like? Yeah. And so when, when I, the, the issue where Wally tries to make him ditch Titans Academy mm-hmm. was like, Oh, I get this character now because this character is me and Wally is my cousin who is, you know, an absolutely crazy, uh, you know, rule breaker. And so Ace being this kind of like trying to keep it together and trying to figure out what his legacy is, but Wally inviting him into the legacy of being a flash and like finding out, Oh, we don't just, we don't just patrol Keystone. Mm -hmm. We patrol the world, you know? Yeah. it was like now I suddenly saw the banter between them and it was funny and it was like, oh, they're cousins and they have the shared history and they're very silly together. And that was really fun. And so I really liked writing him as well. Yeah. So, and I, I love that scene that you just talked about how you said like they patrolled not just the city, like yeah. the whole world. I just re- that I remember reading that. And I was like, man, I love that. Like that's yeah. flash. You know what I mean? And of course, I, I'm always going for the joke too. It's like, but also we see the Legion of Doom headquarters and we break a piece. Yeah, <laughs> that was hilarious too. And like I said, yeah. the callbacks to everything, yeah. it was just really great. And like I said, I really, really enjoyed the run. And cool. while I'm sad that it, you know, had to come to an end, yeah. it's also exciting though, because that means that you get to do other things like Green yeah. Lantern, which yeah. we talked about a little bit here and there. So you've described the new Green Lantern as a soap opera on Earth. And yeah. you're bringing Hal Jordan back to Earth, character who has had a like similar to the Flash, very crazy history, very deep lore, and like very deep mythology. So I I've read the first issue again. Right. The DC app cut me off, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I got two more issues to read. But I yeah. also really loved what you did with him in Night Terrors. And oh, thank you. That and again, like that was kind of one thing that really put it on my radar was the way that you spoke about. Hal Jordan in the Night Terrors panel talking right. about, you know, he's a character, he he fears things, but his thing is that he can overcome those fears. And like yeah. I just thought that was a really cool angle to hit for the Night Terrors run. So yeah. can you talk a little bit about what can we expect from Green Lantern? Like I said, I know it's gonna be soap opera on Earth. Seems like you're very you're really focusing on Hal like as a person as opposed yeah. to a Green Lantern or like a space cop. So right. what can we kind of expect? And I know too, we're going to get into this. You're going to have a nice reunion coming up uh, in yeah. issue four. So how yeah. does that feel? It's a, listen, it's awesome. Hal is, as I'm beginning to figure him out for me, um, because the mythology is so crazy and that they did it all, you know, there's all these lanterns and there's all these <laughs> colored, the emotional spectrum and stuff. It's like, it's so unwieldy that like, I'm like, I got to keep this grounded. I have to keep it small so that when we go big, everybody will come along for the ride because they like him, you know? And I want to make people like Hal. I want them to enjoy reading about Hal. Mm. So yeah, there's a lot of soap opera elements, but there's a lot of action and stuff that mm. that is, you know, a key component of it. But there's a lot of character stuff that's going on. And it's just like Wally. I wanted I wanted to figure out how I'm writing Hal before we get a little bigger with it. So there's a mystery in space after Jeff Thorne's run. Um, there was a lot of loose threads, which were like, United, the Guardians are gone. The United Planets are in control of the core. Like mm-hmm. there's a giant, there's no Bauer battery. There's a giant ball of source up there mm-hmm. and that John Stewart had made. And, and so something happened between the end of Jeff Thorne's run and after the Great Darkness showed up, in dark crisis and so something happened that that had Hal come back to earth so that mystery is going to unravel over time mm-hmm. it's also going to explain why sinestro's on earth i, I don't 
I don't belabor it though. It's not like you're going to be like a year later, like what happened? It's like new, no, you know, a couple <laughs> more issues. We're on issue three by issue yeah. six. You'll probably know, you know, <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> you know like I don't, I, I value everybody's time and money. You know, I don't sit there and go, yes, well, next year you'll find out. It's like, yeah, no, man. not the long thread kind of guy. Right, right. Because I've got some other cool things I want to get to with how. Mm-hmm. And I have to just set the groundwork so that we all know, okay, this is the guy we're following. Mm-hmm. This is the story we're following. These are the mysteries we have to solve. And then we're going to take off from there. So it's going to be, oh, yeah. I'm really excited. And Zermanico's art is just outrageously good. Oh, so. yeah. The art in issue one. And uh, he, did he do Night Terrors? No, uh, that, okay. that guy was uh, uh, Eduardo Pansica, who is okay. incredible. Say his well. art's incredible too. But yeah, yeah. issue one right. art was just really oh, yeah. really Zermanico's, cool. Zermanico's, he did flashpoint beyond that we did oh, and, okay uh, and he just can he's just good yeah he's, he's good, good. Yeah. but uh i really love that take though i feel like especially with a character like green lantern who has been in these crazy kind of cosmic stories and you know universe affecting kind of storylines I, again, talking about going back to kind of taking big swings, I don't know if it's necessarily a big swing, but I like that you're bringing that back a little bit and like, okay, like let's bring him back to earth. Let's ground him a little bit and kind of delve more into who is this guy. I mean, again, I'm not a Green Lantern expert by any means, but like from what I do know of how he's been through the freaking ringer. I mean, he was evil at one point he came back from being evil and like just all this stuff. So I think that at least in my opinion, bringing him to the ground and bring him to earth, I think is a very smart move. And I think it gives you an opportunity to really explore where he's at right now. And that's like what I'm very interested in. And what I'm, like I said, for someone who hasn't read green lantern in for a long, long time, that's right. what really pulled me in and was like, okay, this is interesting. Don't get me wrong. I love a good space fight with, yeah. you know, I love my boy Kilowog and all yeah. them guys, but yeah. you know, I, character stories, that's what I think brings people back. Keeps people I hope so. Back. I hope yeah. so. Yeah. I hope so. I, it's going to be, I know some big things I want to do, so we'll see if people dig it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm I'm already digging it, but I want to ask, like, we talked about this mythology and all this stuff, but just kind of a fun question. You're writing Green Lantern, and yeah. I think a lot of people love Green Lantern because his power set is so, it's creative by nature. I mean, it's literally a ring that yeah. can make whatever you want. So right. when you're writing Green Lantern, and obviously you don't want to get into spoilers for later things, what are, like, i'm sure we're talking about you what you love the weird stuff you love taking big swings what's like the weirdest or like craziest construct that you want to do and or do you find that that's a challenge when you're writing thinking of new constructs like something like like again green lantern's been around for so long he's been in so many books i'm sure there's millions and millions of things he's made do you ever think like you specifically want to try and make things that people haven't done before yeah. or like yeah, how does yeah, that yeah. work all the time all the i mean that's that's my biggest burden with the book <laughs> is yeah. like i'm trying to think of really creative ways uh, you haven't read the second issue but in the second issue there's a there's a there's a big construct that he does that i was like i don't know if they've done this but i really love the fact that we did it and it mm-hmm. and, and it worked because zermanico did this incredible thing um and it's also the mystery of the ring but yeah i think about that all the time because i don't want it just to be a boxing glove i want it yeah. to be you know, the Spartans fighting the the night terror stuff or, mm-hmm. you know, they're just, that was something that when Kyle was Green Lantern, he was, because he was an artist, they, the guys who wrote that, that was like, it was always cool. It was always like really neat things. And so I just want to like press into that. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. Hal's going to do a, a jet fighter for sure. But <laughs> I also want him to try some other things. And there's an issue five, there's some uh you know four or two but five well four yeah he does some some interesting construct stuff five he makes it he does a, a thing that's crazy so mm-hmm. I, that's definitely something where i'm trying to i think about a lot yeah i i'm sure and like i said i I'm, can only imagine how hard that is like it's like yeah, unlimited but yeah, I, yeah, yeah. you brought up a really great one that I loved uh, when he made the Spartans. I was yeah. like, I didn't even know he could do that. Like yeah, 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 yeah. people yeah. like that yeah. blew my mind. I thought yeah. that was so cool. And I saw 
I noticed I saw you sneak in that little Evil Dead moment in there with the. Yeah, no, I totally did. Uh, oh, it was I awesome. I even posted the script. It was like, we're going Evil Dead here. You yep. know, like, gosh, <laughs> it's like shotgun and chainsaw, man. Yeah, I really love it. And then, like we talked about before, too. Uh, so you're going to be having a reunion in issue four, I believe. Yep, yep Barry. Now, yeah, I was say, so it's Barry, not Wally, yep. right? Yep. So how does it feel having your two big toys getting to play together? Well, it, you know, I Barry's mean, I, a little technically. Yeah, 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 yeah. Barry's a little bit. I just, I just love the idea that like, there's so much focus now on the next generation of superheroes mm -hmm. that I just keep thinking about the guys that are the old Justice League guys, you know? Yeah. So what do they think about that? What do they think about their sidekick stepping up, you know, mm -hmm. and and where does that leave them? And I think Hal's going through a little bit of a midlife crisis anyways. So <laughs> having Hal and Barry kind of talk through it while they're beating up bad guys, was just, it was absolute fun. Yeah, I love that. And I think I even uh, mentioned this on Twitter to you, but I feel like Green Lantern and Flash, that's like classic comic book friendship. That's like Batman, yeah. Superman, Captain yeah. America, Thor. Like, I feel like that's just a classic team up. So I anytime they get to, you know play together i absolutely love that so when i yeah. saw that barry was coming to play in your green lantern i'm like oh man this is absolutely oh, i can't wait yeah i hope i can do green arrow at some point too that would be great Ooh, okay well you did green arrow a little bit i guess he was well yeah 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 freak, the, he was freaking out in uh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the but beginning I mean, green of arrow with, with like oliver and how is, is yeah that's what i mean because they the hard traveling heroes that's that's a cool dynamic as well oh so. yeah yeah, that would be super cool. Brings us uh, to what the, your new stuff. I mean, I'm, yeah. I know that there's stuff you can't talk about yet, and I would never want you to spoil anything. But you got Green Lantern. Yeah, I mean, yeah. hey, if you want to, I'm not going to stop you. <laughs> <laughs> I was, so, yeah, I've got Green Lantern coming out. I've got a Jay Garrick miniseries that starts in October, which is ooh, really exciting. Okay. Um, I have a, another min. I can't announce yet, but there's a book that that's coming out for another company and then there's a book that's coming out for another company so oh. um, that's exciting uh in the comic book world i'm really excited just to sink my teeth into other properties and, and mm -hmm. try something new and then i have um, a lego jurassic park uh retelling that comes out in a month or so and then in october i have a mortal kombat johnny cage movie which is the most insane Ooh. thing uh ever that's gonna be I, fun like Joel McHale is Johnny Cage and Gilbert Godfrey and <laughs> Jennifer Grey is is in it. It's just it's a weird, it's a weird book. It's a weird movie. I mean, and it's I love it. I love that, it. That sounds amazing. I can't wait for that. That oh man, when is that? October? You said that's October. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. So coming up here. So everyone, yeah. be sure so, listeners, yeah. watchers, check that out. And then just a couple last minute questions that we kind of like to ask all of our guests. So. Obviously, you're reading a lot of stuff for, you know, yeah. research purposes. I'm sure that yeah. you have other books coming that you, you know, are reading to so you can know your lore and stuff. But I'm just curious, what are you just reading for fun? Like, what are some things that really, you know, catch your eye these days when you're just sitting around reading something just purely for fun? What is what are you typically grabbing for these days? Comic book wise or just like regular? like any Comic, book? anything. Yeah, anything. Well, what are you have you ever read The Murderbot Diaries by Martha Wells? It's like the coolest sci-fi, hilarious, sarcastic, killer robot book. It's so funny. That's um, I love it. I'm a huge Kelly Thompson fan. So like the, the Birds of Prey, I'm really, really pumped for that's coming out. Oh yeah, the top, all Tom King stuff. Um, I'm uh, I always I'm trying to think what I, what's on my because I have infinite Marvel Unlimited and Infinite, and I'll do the Chip Sadarsky stuff to the end of time. So the Daredevil mm -hmm. run is awesome. Oh, um, so I've good. been catching up on Immortal Hulk, which is unbelievable. Um, and then uh, uh, Marauders is really funny on the Marvel side. Yeah, then, Marauders is good. Yeah, and on the DC side, it's like you know williamson's just doing yeoman's work on uh you know superman and green arrow which is great um i've been i've been going back and reading a lot of cool batman stuff and mm -hmm. you know i i always love uh going into the back issues and reading some really crazy stuff like i reread invasion the other day and i was like gosh i remember this coming out and just freaking loved it mm -hmm. um and i'm trying to think of the the new stuff that's out there's so many there's so much Talk and I try, I try to keep myself really up to date. Mm -hmm. So it, whether it's Dennis Culver's, you know, Doom Patrol or 
Mo's, Cyborg, like I try to keep myself up to date because I want to make sure that I'm operating in the same universe, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, those are just some of the things. I'll just try, yeah. I always try a little bit of something for sure. Mm -hmm. There's just so much coming out and there's so, so much, much good out. stuff coming out from whether it's Marvel, DC, independent. I mean, there's some really great indie stuff coming out. Oh, tons of great just, indie stuff. So when you say like, it's hard to catch up, like, dude, I... I feel you, man. And it's literally right. your job. So I can only yeah, imagine. Yeah, yeah. How Which, hard it by is. the way, is pretty great. Yeah, I would say, no, you can't really <laughs> complain too bad. No, it's everything but, uh, eight Jeremy wanted. He's like, yeah, it's your yeah. job. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I'm sure I've heard this from other people too. I'm sure, like, writing comic books, do you find that it's you it's hard to read comic books? Not hard to read them, but you just don't have time because you're you're so involved in the comic realm. Like I've heard a lot of writers say like, yeah, one of the things that sucks about working in comics is I don't get to read as much comics as I did. Do you find that that's true? Uh, I mean, no, no. Okay. That's <laughs> I good. Mean, I like, I like <laughs> comics. So like, mm -hmm. um, if it's a good run, I'll read it. You know yeah, what I mean? You'll find the time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, cause what else am I doing? Just scrolling on my phone? You yeah, know? right. Yeah, so, and honestly, I, I, feel like less I, that. I still feel like I'm so new to it. Mm -hmm. So when I, I always want to learn, you know, it's like when yeah. I was writing screenplays, it's like the best educator for screenplays was I was doing coverage. So I'd have to read tons and tons of screenplays. And that mm -hmm. was what informed me a lot of how I wrote. Same with comic books. It's like, seeing the way somebody does something somebody like williamson or tom king you know or and and just the artists like mitch or mm -hmm. all the yannick like all these people that i've met over time that i really respect and admire i'm like why do i respond to that panel what is it in that panel like i'm trying to learn too yeah. because i i don't want to just be i don't want to just do comics for a little bit i want to do comics for a long time mm -hmm. and part of that means that people buy my comics <laughs> yeah absolutely so why not read the guys that are selling the most and see like well how do they do this and what, uh, what is it i can learn and take away from this you know yeah i love that and that kind of goes back to what we were talking about when you were you know trying to yeah. break in and it's like you know yeah. it's always a learning process and i yes. love when creatives have that approach of like it, you're always learning always, always looking to improve always looking always. to get better yeah but as far as getting better and all that stuff, I mean, you're killing it right now, man. I've really loved doing this deep dive on you these past couple of days has been an Thanks. absolute joy. Oh, thank and you. one last question before we get out of here. Uh, what is one character that you haven't? So like I said, you've written like the entire Flash family at this point. Yeah. I'm sure that you got a lot of Green Lanterns coming in this Green Lantern run. But what's a character that you haven't gotten to write yet that was like, you would just love to jump at it could be a big character lesser known character like something that you have always oh. been like man do i got a story for so and so that's tough <laughs> i'm uh, sure there's a i'm sure there's a lot dude. like there's a lot yeah there's, so. always, there's always like you know like like i of course i of course someday i would love to be able to write a batman thing of course mm -hmm. i would love to write a captain america thing but there's also the weirdos like i want to write a long shot story you know like i want to yeah. you know uh in the dc i have a dream project um that no one seems to want to do that it's like <laughs> it's like my absolute dream project i can't tell you what it's about but oh, uh, it, is, <laughs> it does involve dr fate and a couple other people and I, mm -hmm. and it's just like i just it's the thing i want to do i bet i tried to do it as a tv show pilot mm -hmm. and um and then everything kind of shut down and i was like oh my gosh i want maybe i should do this as a novel you know <laughs> and then and then but i was really excited about it mm -hmm. so someday i'm going to convince them someday. yeah you'll get them you'll you'll wear them down eventually <laughs> yeah if people buy if, if 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 like if green lantern goes gangbusters then i feel like i have a little bit of pull to be like listen hey yeah. you know, people will buy this yeah <laughs> you know? everyone everyone listening and watching this right now yeah. Go, do not walk, run to your comic <laughs> shop, oh, yeah. get yeah. Green Lantern, get one, two, three, four night terrors. Yeah. I'm yeah. telling you, we've been talking about this for over an hour now. This guy is killing it. If his Thank name you. is on it, I can almost guarantee you that it's going to be uh, awesome. Jeremy, I cannot thank you enough for being here thank with you. me today and nerding out. And yeah. I want to throw it off to you really quickly. Uh, this is your time. Plug yourself. Tell the people oh. where they can find you. We already talked about uh, stuff that you're going on, but 
Green Lantern 4 is coming out not yeah. this week, next week? Uh, yeah, September 12th, my birthday. Okay. And then Happy um, birthday. Well, thank you. Mm-hmm. I have a Space Kick. I have a website now. So spacekicker.com has like where comics are, where movies are. You can subscribe to my Substack if you want to hear about Ninja stuff because that's oh. pretty much all right. Hell and yeah. uh, that's it. You know, it has all the links to my socials and stuff. Beautiful. And I'll put that in the description below. Everyone cool. go check that out. Like I said, if you see Jeremy's name, it's guaranteed to be great. Go get Green Lantern. Go pick up uh, Trades of the Flash. Check out all the DC animated stuff. This guy, he's freaking killing it, like I said before. And again, I can only thank you so much for being here with me today and nerding out. It's been so, so much fun. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Awesome. And everyone out there, thank you so much for watching or listening to this. If you enjoyed, please leave us a like and maybe even consider subscribing. Who knows? You might have a good time. But with that, (laughs) we're going to have to get out of here. Thank you so much. Stay hydrated out there. I hope all of your stacks are fat this week, and we will see you all next time. You want to do this all day?